Sorry to Bother You is the brainchild of director Boots Riley. You might have heard of Boots, he's in a band named The Coop. The man behind songs like Kill My Landlord and Baby Let's Have a Baby before Bush do something crazy. Being communist with no reservations, Boots created one of the most satisfying anti-capitalist films we've seen in over a decade. To summarize it quickly, and movie spoilers ahead if you haven't seen it, it's on DVD so you really have no excuse. Cassius Green, threatened with eviction, takes a job at a call center. While union organizers start to organize a strike for fair wages, he begins to separate himself from the pack by being an excellent salesman. When he's offered a position in the upper floor, with much higher pay, he crosses the picket line in pursuit of a better life. But being a top floor salesman isn't all it's cracked up to be. His new job has him literally selling death in the form of drone strikes and military equipment. Even worse, one of the company's biggest partners is Worry Free, whose workforce comprises of domestic slave labor. Their appeal is in the name. You sign on for a life of servitude, but you get free housing, free food, it's worry free. The already absurd movie takes an even weirder turn when Cassius attends a wild rich people orgy party hosted by the CEO of Worry Free, Steve Lift. Steve likes Cassius and wants him to join in on the company's newest project. But before he can give him his spiel, Cassius accidentally stumbles into horse people. Freaking out, he gets convinced to stay through the presentation to make sense of the situation. As soon as it's over, CEO Lyft delivers the most important line in the film. So you can make more money? Yeah, basically. I just didn't want you to think I was crazy. That I was doing this for no reason because this isn't irrational. Oh, cool. All right, cool. No, I understand. I just but to make sense of it, we have to travel back a few decades. In 1989, a British sociologist by the name of Zygmunt Bauman was fed up by the absolute state of sociology. By then, academics in the field of sociology had had a lot of time to analyze the Holocaust to figure out why it happened and who was responsible. But according to Bauman, they had done a piss poor job of finding answers. In response, he wrote Modernity and the Holocaust, a dramatic takedown on how we had all collectively failed to understand what the hell happened back in World War II. The Holocaust is a dark stain on our history. How is it possible that in the age of the automobile, skyrocketing quality of life, a progressive era where we had conquered slavery and other societal blights, how is it possible that one nation set out to murder 12 million people? It doesn't make sense. A popular explanation is that this is one example of a larger history of Jewish oppression, a nasty case study on the extremes of racism. Anti-Semitism has existed as far back as Jewish people have, so it's an easy connection to make. It only needed a particularly devilish man in Hitler to stoke the flames. Another approach is to take a more Hobbesian look at things. There is no shortage of reasons to think people are naturally inclined to do evil things. If one takes this view, it falls on the shoulders of civilization to prevent the excesses of humanity. Hitler's regime was the human will unshackled, a rampaging force for conquest. In this case, it was our collective failure to restrain ourselves that caused the Holocaust. In both cases, the Holocaust is characterized as a mistake. But Bauman disagrees entirely. He argues that the Holocaust was the culmination of everything modern society was. To help us out, Bauman illustrates a metaphor. Modern culture is a garden culture. It defines itself as a design for an ideal life and a perfect arrangement of the human condition. Modern genocide, like modern culture in general, is a gardener's job. It is just one of the many chores that people who treat society as a garden need to undertake. If garden design defines its weeds, there are weeds wherever there is a garden, and weeds are to be exterminated. They must be segregated, contained, prevented from spreading, removed and kept outside the societal boundaries. If all these means prove insufficient, then that means they must be killed. It's in this light that we can understand atrocities not as tragic errors on the way towards progress, but as culminations of ideas and processes that encompass a society. 
The Holocaust was awful because it carried the tradition of the modern age to its logical conclusion. Now when the CEO said this, the audience at my theater burst out laughing. One person even shouted, no it isn't, when he said it was rational. And the response makes sense, we're primed to look at these movie villains as isolated cases of extremism. You know, maybe the CEO of Worry Free saw his parents die when he was a child, or his people were exterminated on some distant planet. But I think Boots Riley chose this as a more than a simple gag line. Like every modern tragedy, the worry-free corporation is the climax of everything the world of the movie had been working up to. Corporations with unlimited wealth and power, drastic inequality, racialized poverty, obsessively male and competitive workplaces, and media that serves only one purpose, to pacify the viewer. Genetically modified superhumans that work to balloon shareholder profits is rational, and that's the scary part. So the question is, is this realistic? Is worry free in our future? Yeah, no. The return towards slave labor in the United States would be a reversal of everything that's been happening for the past half century. Our economy is more decentralized than ever. Under the auspices of freedom and flexibility, Companies are moving away from workers and towards independent contractors. They barely want to pay your 401k. You really think they'll pay for room and board? I'd quicker expect a Patreon-fueled return to serfdom than this. But that's a little bit disingenuous, isn't it? You might have noticed that in the summary of the movie, I was careful to point out that Worry Free employed domestic slaves. A lot of contemporary discourse is hyper-focused on whether the bad things happen to Americans. Such a small detail in the grand scheme of things, really, is enough to turn our attention off completely from an issue if it doesn't affect us personally. But it shouldn't matter if the people that are enslaved were born on this continent or not. I mean, yeah, I guess for the statesmen and their geopolitics it matters, but for the other 99% of the planet, slaves are slaves. And the worry-free corporation already exists. There's no what-if about it. Just to give you an idea on how reliant we are on worry-free style labor, developing nations were responsible for 60% of all manufactured goods in 2012. That's your coffee, your clothes, your everything. There are 45.8 million people enslaved worldwide and they generate over $150 billion in revenue a year. This is only forced labor, mind you, and if we're following the rules of the movie, and that includes men, women, and children who aren't technically forced into anything, but have no realistic alternatives. Under this rubric, we'd have to start looking at nearly every product manufactured abroad. I'm not qualified enough to do the math, but with a global GDP of $75.4 trillion, we're looking at an unimaginably high number of slave-adjacent profits. And I hope you're ready for me to pull the rug from under you again, because Americans are being enslaved. Don't take my word for it, take the constitutions. Prisons have become slave empires, with the US housing around 22% of the world's prison population, despite having only 4.4% of the world's population. Our slaves do everything, from work inside the prison, to farm and factory work for for-profit businesses. In response, prisoners have held nationwide strikes on and off for the past few decades, demanding reforms that tend to fall on deaf ears. Curiously, the one defense of slave prison labor you always get is, they don't deserve a fair wage, their room and board gets paid. Despite prisons being highly lucrative closed systems where prisoners pay more than their fair share in labor. Rational responses to slavery is par for the course. We had them in the 1800s, we got them today. Once we start looking at our politics, our media, and so forth, Sorry to Bother You has taken our world and cranked everything to 11. But we were already at like a 6 or a 7. A few details here and there might be off, but this is it. Welcome to Hellworld. But I'd be remiss to not touch on the question of race in the movie. It's the one thing most media outlets have brought up, what with the code switching and so on. And this is usually accompanied with a few mistakes. The one mistake I constantly see online is bringing up Donald Trump. Not everything has to do with Donald Trump. 
and two, questioning whether a sorry to bother you situation is in our future. But the movie doesn't pretend to be a dystopian future, it's a dystopian present. The inability of mainstream outlets to really grapple with the question of class warfare combined with their expertise at dealing with the questions on race is monumental. It shows how far we've progressed towards racial equality, at least in terms of well-off liberal spheres. But it also shows how lacking our general knowledge is in terms of class and imperial exploitation. Thankfully, just like how the film turns up the awfulness to an absurd degree, it's also incredibly hopeful, with an ending that rivals Get Out in terms of satisfying punch. So sure, things might be bad, but who's stopping us from making it any better? <laughs>